Today I'm here with Joe Cornish, one of the UK's most celebrated landscape photographers here at his gallery in North Yorkshire. Now I'm sure a lot of our viewers already know who Joe is, but for those who don't, Joe, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Aidan. Yes, I'm Joe Cornish, landscape photographer. Uh, been doing landscape as a subject for best part of 40 years, but certainly concentrated on it for the last 30. And uh, we're here in uh, the gallery in North Yorkshire. Great. So as a Sigma ambassador, we recently set Joe the challenge of shooting with a range of our lenses. And today we're going to be having a look at some of the images that Joe's captured when shooting with those lenses and hear a little bit about why he made the choices to go for those ones. So I know this is going to sound like a very obvious question to start with, Joe, but how are you choosing which lenses to use when you're going out and taking photographs? If I'm absolutely honest, Aidan, the, the, the main consideration is how far am I going to walk? <laughs> because I suppose uh, ideally you'd have the widest range of lenses available to solve every single problem. Mm -hmm. However, the reality is that uh, it, it, if you're going to walk, say, three, four, five miles or more, uh, you want to use a relatively lightweight outfit. Yep. Whereas if you're not too far from the car, you've got a specific site in mind, or maybe it's some woodland where you get straight into it from a nearby road or lay-by, then you can you probably carry everything but certainly going up and downhill, it's weight is the main consideration. Um, so at the moment, uh, the, uh, the range of lenses that I've selected for, for this exercise are a 24, mm -hmm. F2, a 35 F2, uh, a, an 85, a 1.4, and then two zooms. So there's a 24 to 70. Okay. 2.8 and the 150 to 600, which might be a bit of a surprise, but uh, uh, the two of them together, I would sometimes take out only and no primes. Yep. Other times I would take out just the primes and sometimes the primes and the shorter zoom. So the first image that we've got here was shot on the 24 millimeter, is that correct? It is, yes, 24 F2 contemporary. Yeah, and it's, great. it's really interesting this because for me, this is quite an intimate kind of shot of the landscape. So usually you'd associate 24 millimeter lenses with quite you know, wide, expansive landscapes, whereas this is one of the smaller details within the landscape. I think that it, what's important to remember is that every, every picture is, is a battle of some kind with perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of reasons why that focal length was chosen for, for this image, even though there's no sky, there's no wider landscape at all. It's just really to do with feeling immersed in yeah. this place. And what the wide angle lens allows you to do is to get over things, literally physically as well, and include them, uh, as well as, in this case, the waterfall uh, beyond the big rock slabs. So it's, it's a, a matter of feeling, but ultimately about the framing that worked best for this subject matter. And by the way, I, I this might sound surprising, but I almost never shoot with anything wider than 24, or if I'm working with a larger format, and the equivalent. So with, with 35, which I, I shoot a lot, 35 millimeter format, which it, this is, um, the, the 24 is the widest I want to go. And the reason for that is that generally, the 24 represents a kind of threshold that I, anything beyond that, you really start to feel the wide angle of the mm -hmm. perspective stretching the space too much. Okay. So for me, it's, it's a natural kind of um, starting point in the wide angle range. I wouldn't generally go wider than that. Okay. And is that simply that when you're shooting with a much wider angle lens, it's giving you that sense of distortion within the image, whether it's you know, an over-exaggerated foreground, for example, and you're trying to keep things a little bit more true to life, perhaps? You could say that, yes. It's to do with exaggeration, to do with the fact that uh, a, a super wide, it announces itself, as we sometimes say, uh, rather too much. And mm -hmm. so the beauty of using uh, this, it, I mean, I'd like to think you wouldn't necessarily know if you looked at that picture, that it was shot with a wide. It just looks vaguely wide, maybe. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, the one other thing that's uh, that's worth one point that's really worth making there with the twenty four is that inherently there's a lot of depth of field yep. at this point too. So with a picture like this, which is so much about texture, it's possible to to get a kind of continuum of of detail from the very closest elements uh, to the distant, more distant waterfall, in spite of the fact that the the focus point is actually in the middle 
okay. here around the crown of the rocks. Okay. So what's quite interesting is if we move on to the next image now, it's been shot with the same lens, but we go from something which is very kind of intimate looking at more of a vignette within the landscape, something which again is a lot more expansive, so maybe something a little bit more in line with what people would traditionally think of with your landscape photography, so very different. It's a, this is a, a, fair, a much more obviously wide angle perspective as well and, and, and perhaps it's right at the limit of what I would regard as acceptable in that re respect. Um, but I will only use the wide angle lens for or in ways which I feel lend themselves to the space. Mm -hmm. And in this case, if you look at the, the, these kind of linear elements that echo each other coming in from the edge, there's a kind of convergence uh, role that they're playing. Okay. And, and that with the, with the less wide lens, because I did look at this with a, with a less wide lens, there's less energy uh, right. to the perspective. Uh, and in fact, what I did make a version that didn't work as well with, it, with a narrow lens, but th this, I felt that the feeling of movement, motion, which is enhanced too by the long exposure, because the clouds are moving mm -hmm. in this picture, helps to create a dynamic that is basically at the heart of why this picture does work for me. So I believe the next image that you've got was shot on the 35mm lens and for me this one also conveys that sense of place really strongly. So we see so many I suppose chocolate box shots of Scotland with beautiful blue skies but what we have here is something which is very moody, very dramatic but also shows the changeability within the landscape as well. So the, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a very recognizable spot, it must be said, so nothing very original about the location, but I, I do like this composition. And mm -hmm. the, the, I think it's important to remember too that weather is weather, you know, where, wherever, wherever you are, you, you have to face it as it is. So the question for the photographer on any given moment is, can I make a picture that, that conveys something, a feeling or a, an idea or a mood uh, in those in those circumstances, here the sky was quite sort of soft in not much detail or texture in it, um, and and at the same time, it, you know, it, it, it's one of those sort of fairly foggy-ish, but not really not really well described fog. So not the easiest uh, of of situations to work in, but nevertheless, it's still an incredible location. And in, in the middle of winter, very little, just a little bit of snow on the tops. Mm -hmm. um, it's never going to be the, a, a sort of crowd-pleasing image, but does it convey something about what Glencoe is like? I think it does. Yeah, I think it's got that real sense of authenticity. And actually, I think the fact that he's shot with a 35mm lens, which is fairly close to what we're seeing with the human eye, kind of works with that mm. as well. Mm. And how did you find the lens perform in the inclement weather as well? Well, w one of the great things about all of these uh, these new lenses is that the, they seem to have very weather protection. Let's put it this way: I've worked them in the rain and had no no issues at all. So, I mean, the issues are the usual issues you have with rain, which is getting raindrops on the lens, and that's a part of the all all part of the fun of, of being out in all weathers. Um, the rain was coming and going on on this particular day. Mm -hmm. I almost always carry a brolly with me, even if it's sunny, because brollies can be really useful actually when it's sunny. So yeah, they, they come in handy, but that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to ever have to worry about the equipment when I'm shooting. Yeah, and I suppose with landscape photography, a lot of the time, the best light that you're getting is when you've either got bad weather on the way or bad weather going as well. Definitely, definitely. Those edges of weather systems are one of the most dramatic conditions occur for sure and um, yeah you want to be able to to tackle them when you can and um, rain in particular i absolutely love rain I mean, that might sound strange but i love being especially being on the edge of it so i love seeing rain falling in the landscape particularly yeah. um in these wonderful waves and it, it just to me it's so archetypically british or maybe northern european to see that kind of weather um, and it animates the landscape brings it to life brilliant so what have we got next Okay, so same lens, but a very different environment and very different lighting conditions as well. So we've kind of gone mm. from very soft, overcast lighting to something which is a lot harder with the contrast within this landscape as well, and a different time of day as well. Believe it or not, I actually used an umbrella in this picture. Oh, really? Yeah, mm. to, as a flag uh, to, to keep the sun out of the lens. Although I must say, the, actually, the, uh, the optical characteristic of this lens is really, really good uh, in terms of flare. Okay. But 
it, it, I'm just so much in the habit of trying to keep the sun out of the lens wherever possible yeah. to maximise image quality, and that was the case here. I suppose that's all kind of the process as well with this. And, and do you find these lenses, I mean, the, the I-series lenses have got that lovely metal build, the very tactile, mm. manual aperture rings. Do you feel that feeds into the process as well for you and kind of informs the photography? Well, it does. And uh, I think, after all, most of my photography is actually done on a tripod. Mm -hmm. So, in a some sense, you might think the tactility isn't so important, but in fact, it really ma makes a lot of difference to me. So, my process uh, is is to use the. Uh, I will typically focus with the lens wide open, check the uh, using focus peaking because being of a certain age, my eyesight's not that great these days. <laughs> uh, but I know where to target in the image, so I'm looking for absolute precision. Um, okay. Uh, on where my, my chief focus point is, and then I will usually stop down to taking aperture. So it's really nice to have the manual aperture to give that feeling, and that gets like a connection to the process, which you don't probably get so much, I think, when you operate the aperture from the camera. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about the I series lenses is they have a very long focus throw. So although they auto focus as well, I use a manual all the time and have really, really good action. And you can watch the focus peaking just ebbing and flowing through the image as you use that lovely, you know, long throw helical. So it's a, they're beautiful lenses to use from a, a, a physical tactile point of view. It's really interesting as well, the, I suppose, the contrast between you've got these very graphical lines with the rays of light, but then you've got quite skeletal shapes with the trees as well, which is quite fascinating looking at how they react with one another. I like to think that it, the pictures uh, that are good have contradictions in them. You know, sometimes they're like emotional contradictions or contrasts, which, uh, yeah, and I, I think there's, a, there's like a warmth to the light for sure here as well. It's, it's shot uh, on a winter day, short winter day, the sun is relatively low in the sky. There's a warmth from probably the, the dust in the air as well. But, but actually you could say some of those shapes and forms are quite sort of threatening mm. um, and, and that therein lies some of the contradiction. Even there's a slightly serpentine quality about this, this tree uh, in the foreground. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, I, but I like pictures that ask questions. Okay, so let's take a look at the next image. And what was this one shot on lens-wise? Uh, it's the 85mm f1.4 art. Okay. So that's quite interesting, that's quite a big jump from 35mm to, to 85 I know a lot of people would have a 50mm in there in the middle as well. And of course, traditionally, a portrait lens is what people associate an 85mm f1.4 with. Uh, but an 85mm is a great focal length for woodland, actually, as it happens. So, yes, I, I, it's one I almost always take with me if I go out into the woods. Uh, I love the fact that it, it's obviously narrowing the perspective or the, the view, the frame down. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the fact that it's a 1.4 is a bonus, really. It isn't that I would necessarily shoot with a 1.4 that often, but um, this, this particular lens is remarkably compact for such a fast lens, I have to say, and that's, that's really nice. Yeah. It's also got a manual aperture ring uh, and, and lovely long throw focusing as well. Uh, so it's a beautiful lens to use, a big lens hood and, and everything about it is incredibly impressive actually. It's also very tactile. Uh, but being an art, it does have a, a slightly different feel to it. It's, it's interesting as well that you mention, I suppose the 85mm being a slightly longer focal length and that lending itself really nice for photographing woodlands. Um, speaking quite selfishly here about my photography, I really struggle with uh, photographing woodland because there's so many distractions and so many things mm. going on and it's um, I suppose it's trying to distill what's within the frame. Do you find an 85mm lens itself better to, to woodlands for that reason? Well, you could say that, although as you've seen from the last picture, that was also woodland shot with a 35mm and, and ultimately it's really down to what you're seeing at the time. But yes, it does. I mean, it is no doubt that the longer the focal length, the more in a way you can distill and simplify mm -hmm. any given scene. But perhaps even more important is the lighting. So in this case, believe it or not, that shot in pouring rain. Oh, really? So once again, the umbrella was deployed. Uh, you can't see that it's raining because the exposure is too long. So clearly the rain is moving. Okay. It was coming in these waves and, and it was 
quite remarkable how heavy the, the rain was so heavy there that literally it was just obliterating the background. That's not misty lighting, that's just rain falling. That's, that's really interesting. I immediately assumed that that was just foggy conditions and it gives mm. you that sense of depth within the image where you've got layers to it, but it's actually rain. Okay, and the next image again is shot with the 85 millimeter. Correct. Very different conditions this time. The concept is really around the, the, the relationship between these trees. Um, okay. the shapes that they make and the, the kind of atmosphere that their very gnarly kind of weathered, tortured appearance kind of suggests, particularly the, the tree on the left, uh, which is also quite monochromatic because it's, it's either died or dying. And so it has a slightly um, defiant feel compared to the ones that are living behind it. It's, it's interesting. Again, I mean, the saturation is quite low in this image, but you've got real contrast between the colours. So suppose you've got your oranges and the greens, you know, mm. the opposite sides of the colour wheel with this. And it seems like quite a reduced palette, really leading into just those two colours for this image. It is, and, and those are the colours there. Uh, the, in fact, even in the distance, there's the incredibly subdued. It looks like it's grey, but it's actually slightly red. And that's the, the, the winter, Scottish winter hillsides with mm -hmm. its mix, mixed palette of different um, vegetation, but, uh, but the brighter reds uh, that you see here are uh, Caledonian pine, which anybody who knows this type of woodland knows that they, they have a way of looking quite grey at the bottom of the trunks and then they gradually, as they lose flakes of, of outer bark, the, the redness of the inner bark is revealed. And it's quite a beautiful colour actually, uh, I think, uh, and, and, it, and it, it imparts some life to the picture. Um, could I have made it more, I actually I increased the saturation in it, I have to Did say, you? of the reds, only the reds, not the greens. Um, not, not much. Uh, could I have done a bit more? Maybe I should have done, I'm not sure, but um, there have been other changes here that might surprise you. Uh, one is that I actually reduced clarity. Okay. So that it doesn't become too busy. Lots and lots of micro contrast in woodland can make it look too too harsh. Okay. Um, so what I sometimes do is, is reduce what I call textural um, contrast, but increase luminance contrast. So that's the, the more ambient difference between light and dark. Mm -hmm. um, and it just gives a very slightly uh, more approachable quality to the light, I would say. Uh, but you know, some, some of, uh, one point to make is these lenses are so sharp that there are times when they're honestly a bit too sharp. Fortunately, it's easy to do something about that in post-production because you can reduce clarity and reduce micro contrast. The detail, the fine detail is still there. Absolutely, if you go in to 100% on screen, you can see everything's perfect. But just by reducing that micro contrast, it helps to give that slightly softer feel and move to the image. Yeah, absolutely, and I suppose being mounted on a tripod, being quite slow and methodical with the way that you're working, inherently you're going to be kind of squeezing all the detail possible out of a lot of these lenses. So it's interesting to hear that sometimes it's generating almost more sharpness than what you need. There is an argument that, uh, that you, you could use a wider aperture and uh, you know, and looking at that and thinking, mm, maybe I should just have shot that at f1.4 with the foreground only. Um, being sharp, but actually there is a point where they're a bit too, when everything's still quite visible but not quite sharp, where it will look wrong. So it, it's a it's a fine balance. Yeah, it's it's interesting because we always say that landscape photography is always that dialogue between the subject matter, the landscape itself, and the photographer. And I suppose you want to make sure that you're not always shouting loud in the landscape by using all these tools that you do have at your at your disposal. Yeah, that is very well put. I mean, I think that the, the, the for me, the philosophy of it is is to speak about the subject, not about me, which is also speaking about me, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. because all photography has an element of autobiography in it. Yeah. Um, and the other two elements that I like to think of are at least a geography and metaphor. So and I think any good photograph has the potential to convey something of all of those things if it's a landscape. Obviously the geography, you're, you're drawing literally the, the earth, that's what geography means. Uh, and at the same time, if you read a picture, you will start to sort of pick up clues about, about the photographer and their, their ideas. Uh, about how they're seeing the world. 
and metaphor might appear if you're lucky, um, maybe an expression of the trees in this case. Um, sometimes that's that's more of a um, it's an intention very often, but it's hard to achieve. Mm. I suppose it's so subjective, isn't it? Different people can read photographs in different ways. Absolutely. Um, but that's part of the joy of it as well. It is. Okay, so the next image. It's a quite a change again. And which lens was this shot, Joe? Well, now we're into zooms. So ah, okay. this is a 24 to 70 2.8 art. Ah, okay. And of course, once upon a time, I suppose a landscape photographer wouldn't have gravitated towards zoom lens. It would have been prime lenses for the ultimate quality. But I suppose in this day and age, the difference in image quality is so minimal between the two. Well, I, you know, if it had been 15 years ago, I would have been shooting on large format film with, uh, with only prime lenses were available, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's a big change. It's a big change. And I must say that um, it, it took me quite a while to uh, be convinced that, that zooms would do the trick. There's no doubt over the last few years, they, they have improved uh, remarkably. And, and so for general, general purpose, landscape photography, a zoom is a great lens. And I suppose going back to what you were saying earlier about you know, traveling light when you know you go, especially in these local areas as well, mm. the convenience of a zoom is going to be ideal for that. It is. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. If you just want to go out with one lens and uh, and let's say in my case, I would take a tripod. You do you know a lot of the time you don't even need that. Uh, it would always be a twenty four to seventy. There, uh, it's the perfect all rounders uh, or landscape photographer's lens. I would say. Okay. Now, of course, anyone who's familiar with your photography will recognise rosemary topping in the background here, which is, is almost like a recurring theme in your photographs. The local area is obviously of a massive um, inspiration to you, and it's, it's something which you seem to come back to time and time again. It is, and, and actually the funny thing is that over the years, I, I've, I, I did wonder if I were really tired of, of photographing the local landscape, but since, uh, since the pandemic began, when I was forced to really uh, the, it was the only source of inspiration I had for a long period. Um, I actually think it, it was really helpful to me to, uh, to be forced to reconsider it and, and see it in a new way, even when sometimes it was very familiar compositionally. So this, for example, is a, is a, a scene that I've photographed since the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. And I keep going back to it at different times of year and different weather conditions. And in a way, it's become like a, a kind of... What's the word? Um, it's like returning. It's like returning to a familiar piece of music, uh, and playing it, and enjoying playing it, mm -hmm. um, and finding maybe new pleasures in and new and nuances in it. And after all, in the landscape itself, the the landscape does literally change. The trees change. The trees grow. They lose branches. They some of them die, fall over in storms. So um, even that, it's quite fascinating to me, but it's still a, a, a place of beauty that fits with the distant landscape. So rosemary topping, yes, it's important, but it's only a, a, a small detail in this picture. Mm -hmm. But for me, the, what, what I love about it most is, is the central larch with its lovely sinuous branches, which to me have a very graceful and harmonious quality. And, and there's always a little bit of a problem solving involved in where exactly you stand to get the trees on the left to work best and so on. Okay, should we take a look at the next image? Well, this is another local scene. Okay. But that is the woodland immediately below Rosebury Topping, the summit okay. of, of Rosebury Topping. Very subdued lighting here. And I suppose this is the place which, I mean, you know very intimately at this point, you spent, you know, 20 years, is it, photographing this area? Mm. And again, over the past few years with, you know, lockdowns and things like that, I imagine you've really been able to immerse yourself within this local area as well. Especially Newton Wood. And I would say that of all the places that have meant the most to me over the last few years, uh, this is it. Uh, I've, I've spent, well, months of my life now walking through this place. Uh, and, you know, it's a... It's a form of practice, you know, walking those paths and uh, seeing the, what is familiar, but almost always changing because mm -hmm. of the weather, because of, of subtle changes, because there's been a storm come through there, trees have perhaps fallen, or one of the foresters has been through and, and removed or changed some of the trees, or because it's, it's the end of April and the garlic is starting to appear. There's so many little 
subtle changes that are, are, are so much part of our seasonal world in the UK that, that can be enjoyed there. And I suppose this picture is one of those because it's, uh, it's towards the end of October, the bracken is turning. Yeah, I suppose with landscape photography, a lot of the time people can get quite overwhelmed with wanting to convey you know, the larger scene a lot of the time. And really, I suppose, you know, the, the landscape within its entirety. Do you tend to find that having spent a lot more time within these places, you start to appreciate some of the smaller details as well? I think it's when you look at, at the small things that you, you start to pick out those, those intimate and, and dynamic relationships in a way that the, the larger scene tends to sort of dominate the everything in a way uh, but but by focusing in on uh, an area of woodland like this you it forces you to consider all of the relationships in the picture I mean here it's the trees are ostensibly would appear to be the subject matter uh, and they have this is one central tree it's divided and then the two attendant side trees which are gesturing in a different direction but also the texture of the, of the bracken as it, it starts to fade back into the earth in the in the autumn is is very important slightly moving with the with the breeze running through it one more thing i wanted to point out though that's important and this is more of a general woodland woodland consideration is that this focal length and i i forget the exact focal, focal length it's shot at 24 to 70 um, but it's at the wider end uh, it could be 28 let's say is that I've deliberately avoided including any sky. So there's a, a few areas that are brighter here, but they represent distant landscape. It's actually looking down somewhat. So distant landscape is okay. open up in the distance. And trapped highlights can be very destructive to how a picture reads. So being able to contain the light with a picture like this emphasizes certainly the sense of intimacy, but it keeps the attention on the foreground. That's the most important thing. Okay, so let's have a look at the final images shot with the final lens. And I know that these ones have been shot with the 150 to 600 millimeter DGDN sports lens, which may come as a bit of a surprise to some people who might not think uh, telephoto zoom lenses are going to be used that commonly for landscape photography. Well, I must be honest that I, uh, I was really interested in it initially because I know that I'll be in the I hope to be in the Arctic later this year. So wildlife uh, was what I was thinking of. But in point of fact, the more I thought about it, well, a I wanted to try the lens out in the landscape, and I have used long lenses happily successfully before. And I must say that uh, that for the location that that these uh, two pictures were made, it's at Fountains Abbey. Mm -hmm in North Yorkshire near Ripon. Uh, the landscape itself is, is not flat, but, but sort of quite rolling, quite gentle. And so if you want to avoid the sky and just focus on texture, you need a pretty long lens, otherwise it, it's difficult to avoid it. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I was really surprised at the more I carried around with me, it's quite a big lens, but it's not overwhelmingly heavy. Mm -hmm. um, the more I found myself looking like this you know down this sort of very narrow and thinking oh that's really really interesting yeah. and and so you start to tune into that way of thinking and so the examples here i think this one is actually at 600 millimeter oh, wow. focal length uh, which of course you know i wasn't using that all the time but yeah this is a very very long focal length indeed and it's actually looking from the deer park into the water garden area uh, of the abbey uh, where the river scale is. It's, this is a, a quite a significant distance mm. from the lens. And yeah. this view, it sounds like it wouldn't be possible through summer because you know the octagon will be obscured by the trees at that it, point. It, exactly, or even you know spring and autumn as well. Uh, so they, there's other things you can do then. But the, the, actually, to me, the the tr trees. In fact, this is possibly a good moment to go into the very last picture. But trees, when they don't have any canopy have something quite magical as well. Mm -hmm. So on that note, if I, whoops, there we go. So it's the <laughs> last picture, <laughs> which is also from uh, Fountains Abbey, Studley Royal, uh, this time in the deer park itself. Mm. And this is interesting because this one's called Chattering Neighbours, isn't it? And I mentioned before, for me, this image, it's got quite a sense of like dance or something like that with, uh, with the kind of twisting movement you've got on the tree on the right there. There's a lot of movement, isn't there? I mean, I always think it's interesting to imagine trees. If you could time-lapse trees over 
50 to 100 years, which obviously we can't, uh, not in our lifetimes anyway, um, it, you'd see them literally moving, you know, and, and they, as they grow and they, and they shimmer around and they do dance. And mm. So it's, it, it's as, if, as if they're often held, especially when you see them in relation to one another, in a kind of slow motion uh, form of dance. Um, it's backlit. Mm -hmm. The background is, is the hill in the background, but it's not really a hill, it's just a sort of gentle slope. By using the very, very long focal length, I was able to avoid the sky. That's a primary reason. I was also able to juxtapose these trees much closer to one another than I could have done if I was closer where this uh, sweet chestnut on the right would have been really, really dominant and the beach in the background would have been pushed back quite a lot. So by, by, by literally moving away from them, I was able to bring them together yeah. uh, in the same. I suppose it brings them onto a slightly more even keel and you can see the dialogue between them. I think what's really nice with this one as well is that kind of warm light that we're getting in the, in the top left as well, which is slowly kind of coming through. But it's, it's quite a subdued palette on this one again. It is. And it has made me, th well, I, I think one of the things I always feel about, about printing is that you do need to live with pictures. Uh, to, to really know how they work and whether they, whether they, they have a, achieved a, a kind of life of their own, if that makes sense. And I think this one is a little bit too subdued. So I would, if I were to print it again, uh, I'd probably push uh, the red saturation up a bit. Whereas, as it was, I did quite a few local adjustments, mainly darkening just the foreground okay. here. And there's a little bit more texture uh, given to the uh, tree on the right. Uh, because that's some lovely detail in the in the bark, um, and actually subdued uh, the the beach in the background with a little bit of minus clarity, but then the the background uh, lighting is early morning sunlight, and mm -hmm. although I think it's probably quite a, a truthful reflection of what the light was like, I think the print needs a bit more a bit more depth, and I think that that would come from colour here. Yeah, it's great to see landscapes being shot with a longer focal length as well. And I suppose one of the things I wanted to ask is, you know, using a longer focal length, do you use this as a tool to help you, you know, express something different? I mean, a lot of photographers are going to gravitate towards the ultra wides for it, but, you know, this is the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, for me, it, uh, sometimes it's just about problem solving. How do you make a picture w which defines very, very clearly avoids the sky. Let's say this is one of the great virtues of the long lens, um, but but also that it encourages you to think differently. Yeah. Uh, you could place things that would otherwise be quite far apart very close together, for example, by changing your perspective and by moving backwards and then compressing them together. You, the, the term compression is often used um, in relation to long lenses, and it is a, a true consideration. I'd love to ask you the question, what would you say is the best lens for landscape photography? But of course, there's no answer to that. It all depends on you know, what your subject asks yeah. for, what you're wanting to communicate, and, and, and lots of different variables. There's, that, that's true. There is definitely no, no answer. But you could, you, could say, you could ask me, well, if you could only take out one lens, what would it be? And I probably wouldn't really be able to tell you. But I could, if, if you said two, I could, I could probably, I don't know. Maybe I could. 25, 24, 25, 28, I would need, I think. And, and, and then probably a, a sort of somewhere like 50 to 85. But I would struggle to know exactly which one. Probably depending on how heavy the lens was and how far I was willing to carry it. I but that's where, where the, the zoom comes in, isn't it? I think the only solution is to uh, have a broad range like, like you've got at the moment. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Joe. That's been really exciting, really insightful as well. Uh, I'd highly recommend anyone to come visit the gallery as well in North Allerton and, of course, your exhibition that you've got coming up. At Fountains Abbey. Uh, thanks, Aidan. Yeah, nice to be able to promote that. And it's on until the end of October, so very excited about that. I'm very happy um, that that's going to be happening at last after all of these delays from COVID. I just did want to say briefly that the, uh, the, the gallery here in North Allerton, it's not just about me. In fact, it really isn't about me. It's a community gallery. I've got one or two pictures up, but uh, lots of great work by some wonderful photographers and artists uh, in, in the gallery. Uh, so, in, uh, and we regard it as a very friendly place for anybody to come. So we always welcome photographers here, obviously. Yeah, it's a great creative hub, isn't it? It is. Lovely. Well, thanks again for having us in. 
And of course, if anyone does have any questions about any of the products that we've discussed on today's video, please feel free to check them out on our website and we'll look forward to seeing you again on the next video.